Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Jurgen Lobser, I chair the psychiatry department, and I'm uh, happy to welcome you for our grand rounds today and to introduce our speaker, Dr. Christine Yaffe, who comes to us from UCSF. Um, if you're here for advanced trauma life support, that's across the hall and have warm food, so you're gonna have to make a choice. Um, right. Uh, so let me say a little bit about our speaker. Uh, Dr. Yaffe is trained in neurology and psychiatry and epidemiology and a heck of a lot of other things. Uh, she is the Roy and Marie Scala Endowed Chair in Psychiatry at UCSF. She's a Vice Chair for Research at UCSF and a Professor of Psychiatry, Neurology and Epidemiology. Um, she's the Chief of Neuropsychiatry at the San Francisco VA and her research focuses on uh, brain aging, healthy brain aging, and the clinical epidemiology of uh, the kinds of things that contribute to healthy or not so healthy uh, brain aging. Uh, she has over 400 peer-reviewed articles in journals like Lancet, British Medical Journal, JAMA, New England Journal. Uh, that's mind-boggling. Uh, so uh, she's only in her late 30s and with 400 articles, uh, that's about one or two a week, uh, the way I do the math. So that's pretty darn amazing. Uh, anyway, uh, she's also written a book, Chronic Medical Disease and Cognitive Aging Toward a Healthy Body and Brain. And in 2014, she was recognized as one of Thomas Reuters world's most influential scientific minds. Many other honors, I could go fill the whole hour with talking about those, but I won't because then we'll miss a great presentation. Today, I've asked Christine to talk with us about modifiable risk factors for dementia prevention. Now that's something that's relevant to every person in this room. So that's not just something that's out there and some of us think it's kind of cool so we work on it. There isn't a person in this room who shouldn't be worried about that. Uh, and every one of our patients, uh, you know, if we are lucky to get old enough, our brains are going to start failing. Uh, and, uh, you know, it turns out there's a lot we can do about having them fail sooner rather than later. And this is exactly what I'm hoping uh, to hear uh, today. There's also a lot that we do here and that others do to try to understand the myriad of ways in which the brains are failing. But uh, while we do that, I think there's a lot we can and we should do uh, to apply what we already know today. The last thing I will say is this presentation is sponsored by the Herbert Ripley Endowment Fund. Uh, Herbert Ripley was the first chair of this department. He was chair from 1949, which is when the School of Medicine started, to 1969. Uh, and uh, his friends and colleagues started this endowment so that we can bring fabulous speakers like Dr. Yaffe here uh, to share with us. So thank you and welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Jurgen. I have to make sure I position myself uh, correctly. There we go. I think that's good. Um, I'm really pleased to be here. I've actually never been to Harborview, so um, uh, it's really uh, a, a pleasure. And I've actually only one other time really visited UW and, and the VA, so I, I feel like I'm kind of getting some new friends and um, learning my way around I-5 corridor a little bit. So um, anyway, uh, it's really uh, nice to be here. Um, as as Jürgen mentioned, um, I'm going to talk today about modifiable risk factors for dementia. I uh, first want to say I have no disclosures to report. Now Jürgen mentioned that all of us are aging, so it's this topic is important to all of us as individuals and as family members uh, and as people in society. But I think it's also important to put in perspective what's happening in terms of the demographic shifts, in, in terms of uh, numbers of people aging and the projected tripling, we think, in terms of dementia prevalence. This is because we're living longer of course, and also because of some of the de demographic shifts, the baby boomers are aging as a group um, um, more than, say, the, the young people are being born, you know, et cetera. So there's some interesting convergence, which makes this projection extremely important. And I'm going to talk later in my talk about how there may be some secular trends that offer some hope here, but, but in terms of uh, what we know by the numbers, dementia is going to become even 
bigger of a problem. And this is true for developed countries as well as lower and middle income countries. Um, in fact, lower and middle income countries traditionally haven't had people living to be over 55, 60, but now that's changing. And so dementia is really a, a whole new ball game. And um, in many lower and middle income countries, we think there's going to be a quadrupling of the dementia problem. So really, really important. The other thing that's important to sort of set the stage for my talk is the sense that there's a spectrum of cognitive aging. People didn't, this was not the way things were conceptualized, even I'd say 15, 20 years ago. There was this idea that there was dementia, but then there was normal aging. Um, and even longer ago, 40 years ago, there was an idea that actually all of dementia was just aging. So we've come a long way to, uh, to unraveling our concept of cognitive aging. And we now know that there are many people who age uh, without dementia. So dementia is not a normal part of cognitive aging. But there, there are some things that happen with aging that do affect cognition, particularly in processing speed and sort of speed of tests. Uh, and we also know that in terms of the dementia spectrum, there are uh, early signs then there's a probably like a, a prodromal phase uh, called mild cognitive impairment, and then one advances to meet the criteria for dementia. So I think this is really important. This, this is really shifted. And so therefore, if one's interested in prevention, uh, like myself, um, this is the area, oops, I, I, I don't know, I'm trying to, there we go. You can see this is the area where we want to intervene um, in, that, in that trajectory. Oh, I've messed this up, let's see. There we go. Um, that, this is where we want to intervene. And the, and the other thing that we know from some of the biomarker work that's been going on is that there are decades, at least a decade, probably decades, where some of the pathologic um, processes are building up and during the sort of asymptomatic early symptomatic phase. So this is really the window of opportunity. Um, there are a number of, of trials, which I think we'll talk a little bit about if we have time, um, but this is the space that a lot of people are interested in because it's, it's better to intervene here and prevent downstream MCI and dementia. So why focus on modifiable risk factors? Well, first of all, I think they can really tell us a lot about mechanisms. And, I'll, and I'm gonna highlight five I think the five areas, the modifiable risk factors were the best evidence. And for each of these, I'll talk a little bit about some of the mechanisms. But I think we, we can take from these risk factors and we can learn a lot more about what's going on in the brain, why they may be risk factors, what, what is going on. Don't forget, we still have a lot to learn in terms of the pathophysiology of some of these disorders. Um, the other thing about modifiable risk factors is that they can, they can actually identify those at highest risk. So for example, if you want to do some sort of screening or some sort of early intervention, you might take these risk factors, and particularly in aggregate, to, to identify those. And finally, we, we think of these things as possible ways to prevent and to treat. And I'm going to spend some time talking about, as I said, the five of these that I think have the best evidence, and then also how to put them together with a bit of a public health uh, message. So the first one that I think has the best evidence is cardiovascular risk factors. And what do we mean by cardiovascular risk factors? Traditional things like diabetes, dyslipidemia, obesity, hypertension, um, the things we usually think about. So there's been a fair amount of work on cardiovascular risk factors in terms of dementia um, risk and also uh, cognitive aging. I'd say that the best evidence is, is there for midlife associations. If you look at people in their 50s, maybe even 60s, there's clearly an important association both with vascular dementia and Alzheimer's. It used to be thought that these tagged along with vascular dementia only and not Alzheimer's, but that's really broken down. I think it's broken down because we understand that these pathologies are not pure. They often are, are, are they, they exist together. So these risk factors actually emerge. And also, as we understand much more about Alzheimer's disease, there's a big role for vascular um, uh, um, 
mechanisms in, in Alzheimer's per se. So I think this whole dichotomy between Alzheimer's and vascular is really broken down uh, uh, a lot, which I think is actually good. Um, <clears throat> so we've been interested in this area for a while. This is some early work uh, uh, we did with, with some um, colleagues at Kaiser, where we looked at midlife, uh, people from 45 to 55, we looked at whether they had, uh, in this case, hypertension, diabetes, and, and high cholesterol. And then we followed them um, 30, 40 years later to see whether they had um, incident dementia um, in, in using uh, the Kaiser data. And lo and behold, there was uh, a pretty um, uh, significant relationship with, the, with all the ones we looked at. We've also been interested in, in late life. So looking at late life cardiovascular risk factors, in this case, um, looking at a composite and with the metabolic syndrome. Many of you know the metabolic syndrome is a, um, a, a constellation of cardiovascular risk factors, blood pressure, hypertension, cholesterol, triglycerides, blood sugar, fasting blood sugar, and body weight. Um, and you have to have three or more of those things, and that gives you metabolic syndrome. And we found that in, in older adults, as part of the Health ABC study, we found that the, those with metabolic syndrome had an increased risk for decline, but it was particularly true with those who had a high um, levels of inflammation, suggesting that there may be some sort of um, synergy between, or, or in, our, in this case, an interaction actually between uh, inflammation and the metabolic syndrome. And then if with some more recent work, this is actually some work I've been particularly excited about. We've been interested in, in taking this even broader in the life course. And in this case, we're looking at um, cardiovascular risk factors in early adulthood to midlife. And uh, if you... If you um, if you will, I'll just walk you through this. We did something sort of different. What we did was we took a, an AUC model, um, so area under the curve, as a way to aggregate exposure, if you will. So this, these were um, from, from early adulthood to midlife, multiple time points in, in terms of the, the, um, the longitudinal study, and we were able to then look at this as an AUC of exposure to, in this case, systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure, fasting blood glucose, and total cholesterol. Now, none of these people met criteria for diabetes or your, your typical cutoff for hypertension. This was all sort of high normal, if you will. And despite, number one, this being just high normal, and despite people being pretty young, the cognitive testing was done at age a mean age of 50, you can see that there was a really nice relationship between all three of the cognitive testing and this AUC. So the, the less exposure, the better the cognitive function, the greater the exposure with AUC, the worse cognitive function. Uh, less so with total cholesterol, but much more so for, for fasting glucose and blood pressure. So sort of implying to me anyway, that we have a lot to learn about cardiovascular risk factor exposure, even in, in young adulthood, possibly even in childhood. I mean, we can't, we couldn't go there, but I think we really need to get better at understanding with a lot of these risk factors, you can't just study people when they're 80. They've had a lifelong exposure for a lot of these things, whether it's cardiovascular disease, whether it's uh, depression, you name it, alcohol. So we have to get better at trying to, to, to I think, conceptualize this and study it. It's not trivial because you can't do 80 year, 80 year studies. Um, but, but I think it's important to be thinking about the life course perspective. And this is some other work we did. Um, just looking at what, what we would call um, um, ideal health behaviors in which we looked at uh, both cardiovascular risk factors primarily, but also diet um, and physical activity. And again, in the same study, this is the cardio study, we saw that the number of ideal health factors, the more ideal health factors, um, the better the score. In this case, the lower, the lower score is better. So I think we can say pretty unequivocally, the cardiovascular risk factors are very important for brain aging. Uh, it's not surprising, but um, I think uh, particularly at midlife. So being more aggressive at midlife in terms of these controls is probably good. It's controversial whether you want to be aggressive at late life because um, 
maybe the damage is already done and maybe in fact the brain is relying on a certain amount of blood pressure. Uh, you, there's more dangers to dropping glucose to having a high glucose. So you have to be a little careful, I think, in terms of management of these things and not being too aggressive late in life. But certainly earlier in life, I think we have to probably get better. Um, it, it's Probable that the composite risk factors are a nice way to identify those at risk. Again, I think I stress the life course perspective is really important. And I think we need more trials, um, particularly in, in a combination to really get at this. And also ask ourselves when, when is the best time to intervene? Um, again, probably not too late in life. And that may be why a lot of, uh, you may be familiar, there, there are quite a few late life trials that haven't worked out. And it may be, I think, that it's actually you know, too late. So I'm going to turn to the second area, second risk factor. Uh, it's actually probably two things together, but it's really this concept of being active, physically active, mentally active, this use it or lose it that everybody talks about. And that means really brain and body. This is actually um, some work um, from, from rodent um, models quite a while ago, almost 20 years ago at this point. And I, I always keep it in my, in my talk because I think it was, it's such a fundamental study and, and I think it's a fundamental um, concept, particularly for psychiatry and, and clinical neuroscience. The idea basically that the brain is, the brain is plastic, that, that we, in this case in rodents, but also we know it's true in humans, that, that actually the brain is changing and, and the neurons are, are, are um, there's neurogenesis, there's new connections. And this is true not just in childhood, but it's also true late in life. So I think the concept of plasticity and how we modify plasticity or use it in our interventions um, is really critical and, and really is the, is the fundamental underpinning in, in all of our interventions, whether it's, whether it's therapy or whether it's medication, whether it's physical activity, I think it's really so critical. So in this case, you know, the, the, the running mice and, and the enriched environment mice had much greater number of new cells in the hippocampus. So obviously extremely important when you're thinking about learning and memory um, and the relationship between being active. Um, <clears throat> we have a number of studies now in people. This is some early work we did. I remember at the time, my colleagues and I thought, oh, this can't possibly be true. You know, it can't be that the amount that you walk could have any relationship, really. It, it's got to be confounded by all these other he healthy lifestyle issues. But even when we adjusted for everything that we could, you know, in terms of, of um, it, all the, the medical comorbidities and the healthy behaviors, it did seem to be a robust association. And now, of course, there's a lot of, lot of work in this space, um, including some trials. So um, Nicola Lautenschlager from Australia has done a really nice trial where she took people with um, MCI, uh, subjective cognitive complaints, and they randomized them to a exercise intervention or control. And using the, the standard Alzheimer's measures, the Alzheimer's trial measures, she found that there was a, a big effect, well, a moderate effect in those who exercise. But interestingly, the, this effect is as big as the, the, the current approved Alzheimer's drugs. So I think important to know, yes, it wasn't a huge effect, but it's as good as probably the drugs. So we really recommend exercise, physical activity for all our patients. Um, uh, both in terms of primary prevention, but also secondary prevention. There's a lot of work now in terms of the area of cognitive stimulation, um, using your brain, doing crossword puzzles, maybe doing brain games, video games. A lot of interest in this, a lot of people marketing in this space, of course. Um, where is this coming from? The, the, again, the concept I think is very good. And the concept is that we know dementia is lower in people with better education, higher education, more complex professional activities, higher IQ, um, higher stimulating uh, leisure activities. And this has led to this theory of cognitive reserve. The idea here 
And, and I think cognitive reserve probably also needs to be thought of in a life course perspective, because of course it has a lot to do with even in utero exposure and, and, and how you're born and your brain at the time of, of birth and, and early education, but also later in life that cognitive reserve, you know, could be, you can, you can build cognitive reserve later in life. So I think it's, it's the concept throughout life. But the idea is that if you have more reserve, again, whether it's because of early onset or later, that you, you're building out a buffer so that if there's pathology in the brain, amyloid, vascular, tau, whatever, that, that you can withstand a certain amount of pathology more than maybe if you didn't have that reserve. That's sort of my, um, my conceptualization of what this cognitive reserve concept is. And a number of people have really um, spent a lot of their time, particularly Jakob Stern, has really um, pioneered this and spent much of his career sort of uh, validating this concept. We did a study actually that was sort of fun, um, and, and some others have done this similar kind of work actually with PET scans. So what we did was we looked at, these were older adults, non-demented adults, and what we did was we just divided them into uh, high school or no high school um, graduation. So, so the blue, they had graduated from high school, um, and, the, and the yellow, they hadn't, they had less than a high school education. So not particularly high level of education, but these were people in their 80s, so probably uh, what was about the right cutoff. And then we just looked in, in, at the plasma A beta. So people debate how good a biomarker plasma A beta is. We felt in our hands it's actually been, been fairly um, useful. And don't forget that the low plasma beta amyloid is the bad one. So this is one of those ones where low is bad, high is good. The idea is that somehow it's, it's going to the brain, so it's lower in the, in the blood. And what we found was there was this interesting modification, which really speaks to cognitive reserve. So that if you had higher education, in other words, high school graduation, it didn't matter how much plasma beta amyloid you did. It seemed to be there was a buffer. But if you had... Uh, low plasma beta amyloid, it was actually much greater decline with those with, with less education. Again, this idea of the cognitive reserve. And, um, you know, the Seattle um, folks know very well the active trial, one of the real pioneering trials trying mm -hmm. to look at cognitive stimulation in training. Um, and this has been very important work that I think, again, has validated this concept that you can train. You can train your brain in this case, memory, reasoning, speed of tasks, and that even after a year, now they've looked at five years, 10 years, that the actually better training on these tasks. So again, this idea that we, you can train the brain, and I think this is an extremely important concept because if you're seeing a patient who might not be very good at memory or might not be good at executive function, it is possible to actually get better one of the questions that everybody wants to know is, well, does this generalize? Is it, does it just stay on that task or can, can it generalize beyond and might it even be a way to prevent, prevent dementia? Well, we haven't had much data on that until this summer when um, w somebody who's affiliated with, with the active study actually uh, presented this at AIC. The, it's actually has not been published yet. So I think, um, I think there's a lot we still don't know about this particular study, but also the concept in general. But I show this because I think it, it certainly is, is provocative and it's interesting and in that um, it might be that if you had this brain training, in this case, it was only for the processing speed, the speed of test. It didn't work for the memory or, or the reasoning task. But in the, in the speed of test, they did find a, a reduction in risk of dementia. Again, Sort of hot off the press, I think we, we need to know a lot more about this, whether, um, whether others can replicate this, and why, is, why was it only with the speed and not with the other domains? I don't know. But the other thing that everybody wants to know um, is what about these brain games? What about the video games? Because there's a lot of marketing and there's a lot of money to be made. And I'd say that we just don't know a lot about it. This is some work from uh, uh, Adam Gazali's group, which is actually one of the few who've actually really looked at this. Most of the, the, um, most of the companies haven't studied their, their products. So they, they say that you know, it's been um, you know, influenced by neuroscience or it's, they have advisors who are neuroscience, but, that, but you, we just don't know because it hasn't been studied. But, but this, um, Adam's group, they actually looked at this. This was a, um, 
a multitasking training group. And what they found was that if you could train in the multitasking, it did generalize to memory and attention. So I think we need a lot more on this to understand more about the, about the brain games. What I tell people, um, colleagues and patients, is I say, you know, the concept is a good one. The idea about you want to use your brain, you want to be stimulating and learning, we know that's really essential, but I can't tell you that you should use this game or, or, or this software because I just think we, we just don't know and um, mostly it hasn't been studied, just, just marketed. So this is an area I think we're going to see a lot more about. Obviously, it's very important. Um, the idea that this could prevent cognitive decline is extremely important. Again, the question is often, does it extend beyond the task you're training on? Um, and also, I think we need to learn a, a lot more about this from trials. So we need more studies in this. There, there are some trials going on now, particularly with exercise. So there's a big Alzheimer's disease cooperative study looking at exercise in MCI patients as a secondary prevention, sort of like that Lautenschlager thing. So I, I think we will see a lot more about this, but um, I do recommend people certainly that they are physically active and that they try and, and use their brain in some sort of you know, stimulating learning way. So I want to turn to the third risk factor, which is sleep. Um, sleep is something I think we haven't heard as much about. It's not something that um, I think is maybe quite as intuitive, but, but, but actually there's a lot of interest in it now. And one of the things I, I mentioned that it can tell us a bit about, these risk factors can tell us a bit about mechanisms. I think sleep is a perfect example. So some of the work, particularly by David Holtzman's group at um, Wash U, um, has has found that um, if you take uh, animal models and you you let them you know you you make them stay awake or you perturb their sleep, you find that there's actually a lot more a beta um, in the interstitial space, and so amyloid beta is not being cleared. And in fact, there's been a lot of interest in what what does sleep do? Maybe one of the main roles of sleep is actually so that the brain is clearing a lot of of um, uh, you know toxins out or changing in terms of you know metabolic profile. So it's a really I think. Um, attractive uh, hypothesis, um, and there's a lot of good animal work suggesting that the, a really nice relationship between a, a beta levels and, and different sleep parameters. Um, we've been interested in this. We have a, a two big studies where we're actually looking at objective measures of sleep that's either done by an actigraphy, uh, wearing a watch where you, where you can monitor sort of sleep-wake cycles, how much you're active, how much you're not, um, and also PSG, polysomnography, where you actually can learn much more about the stages of sleep and sleep apnea, things like that. So in this case, we, we found that sleep efficiency, so how much you're actually sleeping, how good your sleep is, or how long it takes you to go to sleep, which is sleep latency, but not so much for how long you sleep. Your to the, the total sleep time doesn't seem to be as important as how good your sleep is, which, which sort of makes sense because there are people who really only need four or five hours and there are people who need 10 hours. And so it's really more about the efficiency. But we found that um, in our hands anyway, efficiency and latency seem to be uh, uh, certainly risk for, for developing MCI and dementia. Um, we've also done some, some work in, in younger adults showing that there's some white matter changes with, associated with sleep duration. So people, in, in this case, um, their, their sleep is less, but it, they also have uh, complaints of insomnia. Um, and also some work that actually, um, it, very preliminary work showing that there might be um, some uh, um, dorsal attention network disruption in those who have poor sleep efficiency. So I think a lot of interest in this area now, trying to understand what sleep is doing, how it might be associated with neurodegenerative disease risk, um, and um, you know what the mechanisms are. There's also been a lot of interest in sleep apnea, sleep disordered breathing, um, and I think we were probably the first to show that sleep disordered breathing actually is a risk factor for developing MCI and dementia. We then tried to understand whether it was just the fact that people who have sleep disorder breathing, you know, they're up and they, they, they don't sleep very well. They, they you know, they'll, they'll drop their oxygen saturation and then they'll wake up and then they'll drop it. And they don't even know it, but they're up and down all, all you know, um, all night long. And so they often 
tired and not very restful in the day. So we wanted to see, was it the fact that they were up and down, waking and going to sleep, or was it more the oxygen desaturation? And at least in our hands, we found, and now others have replicated this, it does seem to be actually the, the desaturation. So there seems to be something about um, desaturation, probably, you know, for years, that may be associated with MCI and dementia. So again, I think we're going to see a lot more about sleep. It's become kind of a hot area, um, I think, not just with neurodegeneration, but with, with a lot of... Um, a lot, lot of uh, outcomes, but I think particularly with neurodegeneration. So I think we need a lot more work in this. Um, I think we need a lot more trials. So we, we, you know, we do have some pretty good ways to improve sleep, um, whether it's you know CBT or, or uh, um, light therapy. Um, uh, there's some there's some new drugs, uh, particularly involved with orexin. So I think um, again we're going to see a lot more about this, looking at um, neurodegenerative outcomes. So the fourth area I want to talk about, which is an area that actually for some reason, and I love your thoughts, for some reason it's kind of ignored by a lot of people. And that has to do with depression. Um, ignored as a risk vector for Alzheimer's disease and dementia. I don't know why. Maybe it's, I don't know. But, but it, it is controversial. So some people think, well, it's not really a risk factor. It's more of a prodrome. If you look at in you know, later life and people get depression, it's maybe it's the early, early symptoms of an neurodegenerative process. I think that's true, uh, but I also think it's a risk factor. So I think actually it's, it's complicated. And we know, of course, that people with, with Alzheimer's and other dementias often get depressive symptoms in the course as well. So it's, it's quite a complex relationship, um, but extremely important, I think. And this is... Um, this is just a, 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 a typical plot looking at, at um, the, the odds ratios, anything to the right suggesting an increased risk, anything to the left suggesting a, a decreased risk centered around one, which is, which is um, a no, no, no increase or decrease. Um, and you can see that by this point, you know, there have been quite a few studies um, each of these is a study with the point estimate and the confidence intervals. So you can see, and, and you know, yes, there may be publication bias, you know, um, you know, negative results aren't always published. But gee, I mean, this is pretty unsubtle. It's, everything's over there in, in suggesting increased risk. Uh, so I think, um, I, I do think there, there's a question about timing. Is it midlife again or late life, which we can get into? But I do think it's actually turned into a very important risk factor that we need to pay more attention to. Um, uh, um, Adina Zekia Hazuri is a former postdoc who's now in Miami, and she's done some beautiful work where she's looked at, um, again, sort of the amount of depressive symptom burden. We did this again with this AUC model. Um, by, by Here you see quartiles of burden over 20 years. And you can see that, you know, pretty clearly, the more burden, the greater the risk uh, of um, developing MCI and dementia. So suggesting that, again, you know, looking just at one point in time may not be the best, best strategy. Um, there's also been some work that, that you're prob you may be more familiar with than I am, which is you know, some, some intriguing work suggesting that maybe antidepressants, particularly the SSRIs, may have a role in actually um, uh, decreasing amyloid deposition as measured by PET scans. Vetchaline has done some of this work and some others. So I think you know, this whole depression, Alzheimer's connection is so fascinating and complicated. Um, and so it may depend a little bit, are you, are you treated for depression? Of course, there's also an indication bias, you know, in terms of who gets treated. So it, it's complicated. Um, that actually, I know, is put in for a, a trial where actually she wants to uh, do a randomized trial with SSRIs and placebo um, and actually do repeat re, uh, PET scans to actually see in, non, in non-depressed um, to see whether there's a, a role in, in, um, in amyloid deposition. So, you know, I, I think we're going to know a lot more about this, but it's actually really, really interesting. Um, again, to me, I think it probably is both a risk factor and a early symptom of neurodegeneration. And, you know, to me, it just says, well, we really need to be paying more attention to this. So depression is something that we can measure, we can monitor, and we can treat. 
so I, I think we need to get better at following people. Um, and, and when we're seeing an older person with depression, knowing that actually uh, we should have a low threshold for actually considering neuropsych testing or, or some sort of other evaluation for, for cognitive um, um, symptoms as well. And again, I think there are some really interesting trials that uh, hopefully will disentangle some of this as well. So the last um, risk factor that I'm sort of highlighting is uh, also something that's getting a lot of attention, and that's TBI, traumatic brain injury. Um, there are a lot of ways whereby TBI might have a role in, in neurodegeneration. We certainly know that at the time of the injury, there's axonal sharing, and, and, um, and there's actually probably a, an acute phase reaction in terms of amyloid um, and, and uh, maybe tau. Um, there's a breakdown of the blood-brain barrier. There's probably inflammation. So, um, so lots of things are happening at the time of the TBI. I think the question is then, well, what happens later? And, and um, both in terms of maybe sort of a post-concussion um, syndrome, but also in terms of a risk for actual neurodegeneration. How, how do we make that, that tie? Um, we've done some work, and, and, and um, you know, it's sort of an active space right now. There's a lot of funding for TBI, so a lot of people are really interested in this. And, of course, because of the whole um, sports concussion issues and, and uh, military blast issues. Uh, there's a lot of interest in this. So we did some, some work uh, a few years ago looking at um, TBI actually in, in veterans. So these are older veterans uh, using the national VA data. And we found that indeed having TBI, and this was sort of all, all um, severity TBI, was indeed associated with uh, uh, increased uh, cumulative incidence of dementia, as you can see. And then we did something that I think was kind of fun, which we thought, well, you know, TBI is often not in isolation. There's a lot of comorbidity with PTSD. So it's very hard to find people with TBI who don't have PTSD, particularly in the military. Um, and often they have cardiovascular disease, depression, there's, so sometimes there's substance abuse. So we actually tried to tease this apart a little bit by looking at depression, PTSD, cerebrovascular disease, it should say cardiovascular disease. Um, and, um, and we found that in general, this sort of, there was this additive relationship. There didn't seem to be a, um, an interactive relationship, but it was additive, which I think is really important too, because particularly with some of the military veterans, there are there could be a number of these, you know, cerebral vascular, cardiovascular disease, PTSD, um, maybe depression, substance abuse, TBI, and you know, this is a really important phenomenon that I think we need to get much better at looking at. It. You know, our our veterans are actually aging and probably you know sort of premature aging, if you will. So I think it's really important to to, um, to pay a lot more attention to this, not just in terms of dementia, but I think in terms of a lot of aging outcomes. Um, Raquel Gardner, who uh, was a postdoc and now a junior faculty on a Beeson uh, with me, um, has done some beautiful work. She was really interested in, in this question of um, how does age play into this? Does it matter when you get your TBI? And so she did this, some beautiful work with actually getting, um, she got the state of California ER data. Um, and, so, and she did a really nice job where she took those who came to the ER with, with TBI, and she compared them. She thought it's not fair to compare them to just other other people, you know, controls, people who come in for, I don't, you know, the, the worried well. She actually took people who came to the ER for other forms of trauma. So they had fractures or, you know, the same, same maybe risky behavior, if you will. You know, who gets a TBI? Maybe the same sort of behavior you might get you, uh, 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 you know, a, a broken bone. So, so that was her control group. And despite this, she found that um, having a TBI, uh, particularly a moderate to severe TBI, which you can see, was, was clearly associated with an increased risk of, of developing dementia several years later. Um, and then she tried to stratify it by age and severity. So it turned out if mild TBI, which is controversial, we don't know as much about mild TBI, but in the, in the younger group, mild TBI didn't seem to be a risk factor. But in the older group, 
uh, mild TBI was, in fact, um, as much almost of a risk factor as the moderate to severe. So really interesting, suggesting that maybe the brain is more vulnerable um, with age and that a mild TBI in younger adult isn't a risk factor, but it is in, in later life. So again, I think a, a lot more work needs to be done, particularly at this mild TBI thing. Um, and you know, what is what is the CTE? I mean, CTE is really an evolving story. Most of the work on CTE is really just based on pathology. We don't know what the clinical syndrome of CTE is really. It's, it's mostly been anecdotal. So I think a lot of work needs to be done on following people prospectively. And those studies actually, there's a lot of money from DOD and the NFL um, looking at some of this. So I think we'll know a lot more about this. Um, a lot of interest in biomarkers, of course. Is it, is it the amyloid pathway? Is it tau? Is it vascular? Is it inflammation? Probably a combination. So now what I'd like to do is sort of uh, turn the talk a little bit more towards uh, public health um, implications and tying some of what I've said together. I, I presented the five domains that I think have the best evidence. Note, I did not talk so much about diet. I didn't talk about, you know, everything because I don't think the, these are the things that I think have the best evidence. But, you know, there are other, there are other things and there's other things that probably will emerge. Um, we did some work, uh, uh, Deb Barnes and I did some work a, a few years ago where we said, okay, let's look at the things that we know the most about. And we, we had seven, this was sort of before there was much, as much work, I think, on TBI and sleep, but we looked at seven modifiable risk factors. Mostly they're in the cardiovascular space, um, uh, uh, diabetes, obesity, hypertension, and then smoking. Then we looked at physical inactivity, depression, and education. And we said, okay, these things are pretty common. Let's figure out how common these are. So how, how, how common is the risk factor and what's the risk associated with that risk factor? And then we can calculate the population attributable risk. In other words, what's the amount of that risk in the population that might be contributing to, in this case, dementia? And so what we did was we said, okay, here, here are the, the seven things I mentioned. Here are the prevalence of the actual risk factor. Here's the risk that the best we can taken from meta-analyses, or in one or two cases, we had to do the meta-analysis ourselves to get this. Um, and then this gives you the, the, the PAR, the population attributable risk. And, and, and the bottom line was sort of um, that we felt that if you look at these things, it explains about 50% of the variance, if you will, of, of dementia. But of course, they're not independent. So it's very important. A lot of these things go together. Somebody who has hypertension may also have obesity, may also be a smoker. So we then um, did a, a second study where we actually tried to take the inner correlation of some of these, and it ended up being about 30%. So we think that about 30% of the variants of dementia probably couldn't be explained by some of these modifiable risk factors. And that's, I think, exciting. And then we tried to project that. So if you could change behavior, which is not a small if, but if you could change behavior, but not even 100%, just 10% in blue or 20% in yellow, change behavior. So 20% less smoking, you know, 20%, you know, a little more activity. You, you could see that actually, you know, in the population, you could have a really big difference in terms of um, the amount of Alzheimer's in, in the, this is just in the U.S., the amount of Alzheimer's cases that could be prevented. And you could see that there are pretty big, pretty big differences, particularly with the 20%. So what's happening in the real world? I mentioned in the beginning that we're expected to have this tripling in terms of, of dementia prevalence and incidence because of, of, of the demographic shifts. And that's true. But what's happened is really interesting. There have been some now, I don't know, probably seven or eight studies that have all shown very similar things, which is that there's some secular trends, which are fascinating. If you, if you do the exact same study um, that was done, say, in the 90s, um, you know, early 90s, say, most of these, and then a decade or two later, you repeat the same exact methods in terms of 
case ascertainment. Um, so this was a study, this was from HRS, this was from the CFAS study in, in, in the UK, um, this was the Rotterdam study in the Netherlands, this was from a, a study in Sweden, um, uh, and, then, and then there's also one from um, uh, Framingham, which I'll show. And if you do the exact same case ascertainment, what, what we're finding, which is sort of surprising, and of course wasn't really on message in the beginning, is that there's actually been a plateauing or maybe a slight reduction in actual um, a dementia incidence, which is really interesting. And, and Framingham recently published this, they're sort of the, the most recent, and they, they had more points in time, and they found indeed, um, you know, over in this case, more like 30 years, they found really a, a clear decline in the rates of dementia. So the question is, well, what's going on? We know that, that the demographic shifts are happening, but why would there be a decrease in dementia? And we think that it's probably because this is the same time, a lot was happening, and this is the same time where a lot of uh, cardiovascular disease management and public health strategies around cardiovascular disease were being done, in, particularly in the U.S. and in Europe, which is what most of this work was. We, you know, you'd have to wonder what would we see with, with other countries, um, particularly lower and middle income countries, and my guess is you would not see this phenomenon. You'd probably see the opposite, but we don't have that yet. So um, I, this is the time when statins were introduced. This was the time when, you know, critical care units were introduced. So I think a lot of this had to do with better cardiovascular disease control, prevention, therefore uh, less of dementia. The other thing that happened, particularly in Europe, think about what, if you trace back, a lot of the people in the first batch were people who were born peri-World War II. And that, of course, was a time of a lot of poverty, uh, mal malnutrition, et cetera. So I think even that decade or two later may reflect some of that quality of education, diet, et cetera. So I think we can't say exactly what's going on, but I find this pattern really interesting, and obviously it's been replicated now. I think it's actually a, a real message of hope. I think from a public health perspective, this tells us we can do things that actually have a downstream effect on dementia, and it's not all gloom and doom. And when you know this first came out, it's funny because... Um, uh, my colleague who runs the Alzheimer's Association um, really uh, actually had a piece in the New York Times and said, oh, well, this isn't relevant to the United States, you know, and it's really interesting because it was so off message. And of course, the Alzheimer's Association, you know, wants to get more funding and wants to say there's this tripling and that's true. But, but I think that it really, it, it's kind of interesting and it makes us think, you know, we really can't just be thinking about, you know, the latest, you know, drug that hasn't worked we really need to be thinking also of things we can do, lifestyle things, modifiable things, that obviously are going to go along with those drugs just the way it is in, in cardiovascular disease management. So uh, I think, you know, it's time for us to really shift a little bit. So I showed you early that the, the conceptualization of cognitive aging. I actually, this is sort of my cognitive, my, my conceptualization of, of cognitive aging, which is that you start, the age is, you know, this could push, should probably be starting in utero, um, and that, that really, you know, you, we have to think about the, the life course perspective. We have to think about exposures, whether it's education, whether it's cardiovascular disease or TBI, over the lifespan, we need to be thinking about high reserve, low reserve. If this is your clinical threshold, lots can push you over. Of course, you always have the, uh, the overarching um, you know, umbrella of genetics um, and, and, um, and age that you can't do as much about. But, but I think this idea that you can have you know, a big risk, like a big TBI, you can have lots of little exposures over time, um, you can buffer this by your reserve, or you could buffer this by trying to prevent. And then the question is, you know, we need to understand better when. What, do, you, do you prevent, you know, you know is, is, is this, is, does it get too late in life? Or, you know, when is the best time? Are there critical windows for certain things? So there's a lot of interest still in estrogen that maybe there's a critical window in the perimenopause. Is that true for some of these other things? So I think this is going to be a lot of fun to try and tackle. I think there's a lot of questions, but I think it's, it's actually um, turning into a really exciting time. Now in Europe and in, in Australia and now in Canada, there's been a lot of interest in this sort of multi-domain prevention. So there are a lot of trials going on, but none in the U.S. 
Okay, we hope to change that, actually. We've put in an application with um, colleagues at Group Health, so we, we hope that, that that works out. But um, this idea that you can actually, um, you know, take people at risk, at risk because of age, at risk because of genetics, and do sort of a multi-domain, you ask them to exercise, you, you maintain their cardiovascular health, um, et cetera. And so there are a number of these going on. One of them that's been published actually last year was the FINGER trial. You may have heard of it. This is the, a Finnish um, uh, intervention. And they found actually, they, they weren't huge effects, but they found that actually um, the people who were randomized to this multi-domain intervention did better on, on most of the cognitive tests. Not so much memory, which is a little puzzling, but on everything else. And now they're following them to see if this has an effect in terms of uh, changes, uh, brain changes on, on MRI and also um, incident MCI and dementia. There's also been a lot of interest in, in what we can do for cognitive aging, not even dementia. This was an IOM report that um, I co-chaired with, with Dan Blazer. And, you know, you'll see we came up with a lot of the same recommendations. Be physically active. Reduce your cardiovascular risk factors. Manage your medications. Be socially and intellectually active. Get adequate sleep. Um, and we didn't really talk about this last one because I think it's a little less associated with, with Alzheimer's and dementia per se, but avoid delirium, which is easy to say, right? Avoid delirium uh, and, and certain medications. But, but that's, that's um, had to do a lot more with, with um, again, not so much neurodegeneration. Um, so at this point, I'm just going to summarize and say, I think this is a huge public health issue. Um, it's a, there's a great need for trying to understand how we can prevent dementia. Um, I think there's some, some very promising, very low risk. We haven't talked about cost. We haven't talked about risk. Um, but most of these things are, are really pretty um, uh, inexpensive and, and low risk. Cardiovascular disease management, physical activity, um, stimulating your brain, improving your sleep quality or your sleep hygiene screening for depression and treating for depression, um, and traumatic brain injury prevention, which I think we're getting better at, but actually still could, could do better on. Um, I think I've made a, a, a clear pitch for, for longitudinal studies and applying more life course methods. Um, and there are a number of RCTs going on that I think we're going to learn a lot more from. Hopefully, we'll have more of these multi-domain interventions and prevention in, in the U.S. right now. Primary prevention in the U.S. is all these very um, experimental amyloid drugs, which I think are, are essential, but they're being studied in, in you know, young people with autosomal um, presymptomatic Alzheimer's. So it's a very different question, um, very important question, but very different question. How does this apply to the 80-year-old who might have um, vascular disease, a little Alzheimer's pathology, um, comorbidities. You know, it's, they're really apples and oranges. So I think we need both. We can't just be doing one and, and, and ignore the other. So again, I think ultimately cognitive aging and dementia is going to be a much more complex and heterogeneous kind of um, management where we probably have different drugs for different pathways and hopefully we also are able to, co to combine lifestyle um, and, and modifiable risk factors. So with that, I'm just going to acknowledge um, some of my funding and, and collaborators and I think we have a little bit of time for questions. Thank you for a great... Great, great presentation. I'll give you one to start, and that is you said physical activity is as good as the currently available drugs. So I've got a great factoid for us to walk out of this presentation with. <clears throat> but nobody's marketing physical activity. A lot of people can stand and make a lot of money marketing those drugs. Do you have any thoughts or comments on that? Um, so I've been asked to repeat the question, so I, I'll try and do that. Um, you know, the point was if physical activity is as good or, or you know, um, as some of the drugs that we currently have, but but drugs are often have a big um, um, marketing um, uh, energy behind them, profit uh, uh, ability, um, and some of these these lifestyle things don't. I, I you know, I'll be honest with you. I actually think that's a lot of the reasons why we haven't seen it happening in the U.S. 
um, in, in Europe and, and the rest of the world, they're very interested in modifiable risk factors. They don't have a lot as much money. They're not as, as pharma driven. Um, and, um, and I think biotech and, and, and device driven. And so this is their sense of prevention. Whereas in this country, we've come completely the other way. You know, you need both. And, and I think, um, you, you can't have, I, I'm, I, obviously I believe in drug development and I don't, you know, so, so, but I, I think you need both. And I think, uh, how do you incentivize you know, research in this space, I think, you know, it's going to have to come from the NIH and it's going to have to come from um, uh, other forces, public health. It's going to have to come from other things that aren't uh, driving the market. The other thing, just, uh, but I mean, look at sugar, you know, yeah. like, you know, you, you, there's a lot going on that you don't know about. And um, <laughs> the other thing that we know, right, is physical activity is good for every one of the other ones. Yeah. Except for maybe TBI, if you're too physically mm -hmm. active, you might get TBI. Mm -hmm. But it's good for sleep, it's good for depression, yep. it's good for all the time. That's right. That's right. Exactly. Any other questions? And so, in terms of the genetic component of Alzheimer's disease, um, would you say these modifiable risk factors is something that could actually prevent someone who has a, you know, a predisposition to it in their family, or would it just delay offset? Okay, so the question was, um, if you think about genetics, particularly family history of, of Alzheimer's disease, how do these modifiable uh, risk factors work with genetics, and do, would it prevent or delay? Um, so, you know, I'm sure there are people here who know a lot more about the genetics than I do, but um, I think there's sort of two flavors of genetics when you think about Alzheimer's. One is that there's the autosomal dominant um, uh, uh, genetics, which is about probably 1% or a little less than 1% of all the cases of Alzheimer's. So this is people who often in their 30s, 40s get al Alzheimer's disease. It's autosomal dominant, so it's very penetrant. You know, half the people in the family have Alzheimer's disease. And that's probably much more of a pure uh, A-beta mechanism. Um, I don't know of anybody who's looked at the lifestyle factors and, um, and the modifiable risk factors in, in relation to that. But it's something I've encouraged people. So, so there's a, there are a couple of these trials now, Diane and API and A4. And I think they're starting to look at some of these um, and to see how they might interact. But I don't, I'm not sure we know a lot about that. The other kind of genetics that I simplistically think about is sort of more typical Alzheimer's where maybe there's a first degree family history, uh, a fam family history, a family member, and that um, increases one's risk, but it's not an almost dominant pattern. And it's probably, you know, a, a doubling of risk or tripling of risk. And often probably it's APOE4. Um, there's been a lot of work with APOE4 and how APOE4 may interact with, in particular, the cardiovascular risk factors because APOE is a cardiovascular, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a lipoprotein. And we still don't know enough about what, APO, what APOE does, why it confers increased risk. It probably has to do with A-beta deposition and clearance, um, but it's complicated in terms of how it might interact with inflammation and lipids. So I think there's a lot of synergy there with, with the cardiovascular risk factors in particular but um, possibly with physical activity and something else. So yes, the, it, there's been some work with TBI, certainly in APOE, that they, they seem to, to go more together. Are there any other environmental risk factors that don't sort of uh, hit threshold for being included in this talk that you have a lot of suspicion about? Uh, you know? Yeah, so are, are there other risk factors that maybe are brewing or gathering? Yeah, sure, sure. I mean, I mentioned that, um, you know, I didn't really address diet. Um, I think the, I think diet's really hard to study. I think it's so confounded by a lot of other things. Um, so uh, there's been some interesting work. I think some of the other um, psychiatric, the interplay between psychiatric um, disease and cognitive aging, I think is a fascinating area that hasn't really been well looked at at all. So, you know, uh, we've done some work showing PTSD might be a risk factor. Um, 
I think it's really interesting questions around chronic anxiety disorders or PTSD. Uh, I think there's a lot more we don't know about substance abuse. So I, I'd love to see a lot more looking at um, psychiatric disease or, or, or symptoms and, and how that may be. But, you know. You didn't mention anything about social connectedness or socialization, yep. which for a lot of disorders, uh, more socialization, less disorder. Yep. yep. I, I would imagine the same thing would be true for dementia. Yes. So that's a that, that's a nice <laughs> nice setup. Um, uh, the question about social engagement and does social interaction have a role in dementia? So I didn't present that, but there is some work in that area that suggests that uh, being socially connected might be actually beneficial in terms of um, less risk of dementia. Again, I, I don't, I haven't done as much work in that area, so that's maybe a little bit of a bias, but also I think um, it's sometimes really hard to disentangle, um, you know, social connectedness with cognitive stimulation, with being more physically active, and so I, uh, with depression. So I, I think it's, I, I don't think it's not important. I just think it's harder to maybe isolate, but, but I think it's, it's very important. So, <clears throat> Off of what you're presenting, but do you think anyone has or is close to developing a measure of brain health from imaging or from a neurocognitive measure? Do you, are we getting close to that? Okay, so the question is are, are we getting any closer to developing a measure or marker of, of brain health? And I assume you mean brain health with aging. Yeah. Um, gosh, uh, uh, I, I, it's a great question. Um, I think it's kind of a holy grail. I think there's going to be a lot. Of, my guess is it's a lot of it's going to have to do with the, you know, um, uh, connectome and, and looking at, at um, you know, some of, I, I think that's going to be um, in the space where we're going to probably look much better at sort of looking at, you know, uh, where, I think you're going to need to have some sort of um, both anatomic and also um, uh, real-time, in, in a sense, measure of, of how responsive the brain is. I, to me, that's what a lot of brain health and aging is going to be. There's, there's the anatomy, and you don't want to have a big stroke. You don't want to have neurodegeneration or a big TBI, right? So there's going to be an anatomy part, but then I think it's also going to be, you know, how, how are the different um, uh, systems working in sync, and also how reactive are they? That, that, that would be my... You know, but I'm not aware of anything. Maybe other maybe other people know. Yes. Um, with the data on hypertension and liver, do you have enough data to say whether you think it's going to be a continuous litigation effect or below? Mm, mm, mm. mm. Yeah. Mild yep. Mild yep. Um. So the question is with with the cardiovascular, particularly hyperlipidemia and. Hypertension, is there some sort of threshold effect or is it a graded response? You know, I, I think um, traditionally it's just been dichotomized. So a lot of times people would just say, you know, yes, no, hypertension. But in a lot of the trials and, and some of the epi work, it's, it's, it does seem to be a graded response if they've looked at it. Um, and in, that, in our work in younger adults, it was, it was none of them, none of them met criteria for the threshold because they, they none of them had the, you know they were they were in their 20s 30s 40s so none of them had hypertension or diabetes so i think there we saw a really a gradation so i i think it's going to be a gradation and we've done some work with diabetes where it was we've looked at impaired fasting glucose not meeting criteria for diabetes and then diabetes so it seems to be a gradation what do you think about lithium as a trade yeah, yeah. So the question about lithium as a neuroprotective factor. So there's a lot of interest in lithium as a neuroprotective factor a few years ago. I don't know. It seems that it's kind of disappeared. But again, it's really hard to study. So, you know, we thought about trying to do something with the Kaiser data. But, you know, talk about confounding by indication. Like you just can't, nor, you know, healthy people usually aren't taking lithium. So it, I don't know how you, it's very hard to study. I, um yeah, 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 yeah. Not that I'm aware of, but it's a it's a great question. I think I think we probably need to stop. But are, yeah. are we? Yeah, yeah. We should uh, stop because uh, Christine has to go to the airport, and I want to thank you again. For <laughs> <a fabulous presentation. laughs>